Well, please turn with me to the, the book of Romans. We're going to read a passage from Romans chapter 1. I'll be mentioning a number of verses taken from Romans chapter 1, not speaking directly from Romans 1 this evening, but I will be uh, referring to a number of verses from this chapter of God's Word. Romans chapter 1, and we are going to read from verse 16 through to the end. Romans 1 from verse 16. It's on page 1144, if you're following in the Church Bibles, page 1144. Romans chapter 1, and we read from verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, delivered first of all, as we know, to the Jews, but also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So there without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. We'll jump forward to verse 28. Verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Amen. We end our reading of God's Word there at the end of chapter 1 of Romans, and we pray that God would bless the reading of His Word to our hearts this evening. As you know, we come this evening to a, a new uh, series in our evening services that we've entitled, as you know, I, I Need an Answer. And the first question that we, we come to in our series is this question, is there a God? Is there a God? Up until rel rel relatively recently, the, the existence of, of God was almost universally accepted. But that is, is no longer the case. The existence of God is, is now increasingly viewed with skepticism. And it, it's not simply that the character of God is, is questioned, what he's like, what he wants of us, what he's doing. It's the very existence of God that is questioned rejected, denied. And Christians are ridiculed for their belief in God. We're told that there's no such thing. He's a figment of our imagination. Go onto Facebook and, and anytime a Christian speaks or gives the point of the Bible or God, you'll see how God is, is referred to derisively uh, as a fairy godmother, as a, as a great sky fairy. 
and faced with this growing skepticism. This is, is an accusation. It is a challenge. It is a question that we need an answer for. Is there a God? Is there a God? And it's not a question we can ignore. You know, just shut our minds to. Because the ramifications of this questioning, this denial of God's existence are enormous. You see, if there's no God, then the world wasn't created by God. The reason for the world's existence, for our existence, are, are purely material. The world and, and everything in it, humanity, came about solely as a result of, of physical processes, the, the random collision of, of some atoms, the random process of, of evolution. We're not created, we're, we're not the product of God's power, we're not created in God's image, we're not under God's authority. If there's no God, there, there's no God-given rights and wrongs. Right and wrong is, is what you want to be right and wrong. If there's no God, there's no one to whom you're accountable. If there's no God, there's no heaven. If there's no God, there, there's no judgment. That is, that's the reality, the outplay, the outworking of there being no God. And faced with the growing rejection of God in view of, it, of its implication, the implications of this challenge to God's existence, this is a, is a question we need an answer for. We need an answer for those who, who accuse us of, of following the great sky ferry. We need an answer for ourselves as, as Christians to assure us that what we believe is rational, you know, to, to strengthen our faith. We need an answer to give our children who, who are being brainwashed at every turn with this skepticism. We need to be able to teach them, to explain to them, there is a God. And we need an answer for those who are genuinely searching, who are genuinely asking tonight, is there a God? Is there a God? So tonight we come to this first question in, in our series, this fundamental question, is there a God? We start with something that, that maybe you think, where, where is he going with this? But, but bear with me, you'll see how this works out. I want you to, to imagine in your mind's eye a 15-year-old boy telling his schoolmates that he has a girlfriend, going to his, his school friends on Monday morning and telling them with great delight, I have a girlfriend. And as any of you who have been a 15-year-old boy will know, that announcement will be greeted with, with one of two reactions. One of those reactions we could characterize as, as congratulations and, and questions. Nice one. Where did you meet her? What's she like? Those sorts of things. The other re reaction we could characterize as disbelief and derision. No chance. Look at the state of you. You know, you can't even talk to a girl, um, let alone have a girlfriend. You've made her up. She's imaginary. Prove it. And there's an easy answer to that disbelief and derision. He can prove that he has a girlfriend, that she is real, very simply by introducing them to her. You know, here she is. This is the girl that, that I've been telling you about. This is my girlfriend. She's real, not imaginary. Now, the problem for us as Christians, when people say there's no such thing as God, that he's made up and he's imaginary, we can't do that. We can't take them and, and point them to a, to a physical God and point out God physically and say, to them, there he is, this, this, this is God. He's real. And people who don't believe in, in, in God, they say, well, that's because he doesn't exist. To which we say, you know, it's no, it, it's, it's not because he doesn't exist. It's because he's, he's a spirit. He's invisible. And yes, although he has revealed himself to people in, in, in the past on occasions in, in a physical form, he is not a physical being to whom we can point and say, this is God. That's God. He, he is real. He has chosen not to reveal himself 
in that way today. But if we can't point people to God physically and say that is God, this is God, then how do we prove his existence? How do we prove he is real? What argument, what answer, what evidence can we give to prove there is a God? And the fact is, there is no one argument, there's no one philosophical reasoning or piece of evidence that proves irrefutably the existence of God. And again, people who don't believe in God will say, that's, that's simple, it's, it's because God doesn't exist. To which we respond this evening, no. No, it's because God is so big and it's because we are so small, he is so far outside the realm of our understanding. The sort of proofs that are capable of proving the existence of such a God are quite simply beyond the ability of our minds to conjure up and understand. How in the world do you prove the existence of an uncreated self-existent eternally existent, without beginning, without end, everywhere present, outside the, the scope of space and time, a God of, of that being, of that nature, of that character. How do you explain a, a God like that in words or concepts that our little minds can comprehend? We do not have the words. We do not have the capacity to prove, to stand in judgment over such a God. God is too big to be proved or disproved by the, 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 the philosophical, logical proofs that our little minds can understand. But although there's, there's no one argument, there's no one answer that proves irrefutably the existence of God, his existence is seen in many ways, in, in ways that we can see in ways that we can understand, that, that together, cumul cumulatively, point to his existence. Things for which the only rational, consistently logical explanation is the existence of God. Remember a 15-year-old boy. Imagine his girlfriend lives so far away. She lives out of the country. She lives so far away that he can't introduce his friends to her physically to prove that she is real. What would he do? Well, he'd, he'd show them the, the friendship bracelet that she made him for their one-week anniversary. She said, look, she made this for me. He'd play the voice message that she left him on his mobile. She, he'd, he'd show his friends the letters that she had sent him. He had introduced him to the people who had met his girlfriend, who knew her, who had physically interacted with her, talked to her. He'd show them photographs of his, his girlfriend, maybe even photographs of the two of them together, a few selfies. He'd point out the changes in his attitude, in his demeanor, in his nature since they had met. No, can't you see how different I am, how, how happy I am? It's because of her. Things that on their own aren't compelling. They're not compelling evidence on their own. But together, cumulatively, they point to his girlfriend being real. He's not making it up. She's not imaginary. And friends, that's what we have with God. We have evidence. We have answers. We have proof that aren't individually compelling. They don't prove irrefutably. But taken together, taken cumulatively, the only rational explanation for all of these pieces of evidence is there is a God. There is a God. It's evidence that requires faith. Yes, it requires faith. But faith that is rational Faith that is reasonable, faith that is based on a huge 
weight of evidence. We're going to consider five pieces of, of evidence tonight that point to the existence of God. The only rational explanation for which is that God exists. And I'll give you these five pieces of, of evidence uh, bef before we work through them so you know what's coming. Five pieces of evidence, creation, our conscience, communication from God, Christ, and conversion. Those are our five. Creation, conscience, communication, Christ, and conversion. Firstly, creation. Creation points to the existence of God. The very existence of the world in which we live, of which we are a part, points to a self-existent, uncreated creator. Friends, this world did not come out of nothing. It did not come out of nothing. That is an impossibility. Something does not, cannot come from nothing. If there's nothing now, there always was nothing, and there always will be nothing. That's a fact. So if you have something, as we do have, look around, we have something in this world. There is something material that exists here and now then we know it had to come from something. It couldn't come from nothing. And the fact that we have something today proves that there was never nothing. If there ever was a point where there was nothing, nothing is all there would ever be. And when you, you boil down all the, the possible options for the existence of the world, we are left with but two. There are two possible rational explanations for the existence of our world. Either firstly, it always existed, or the material for, that, that made up the world, the, the, of which the, the product is the world as we know it today, it always existed. Or the other possibility is that it was created by something, someone that has always existed. Those are the only two options for our existence and the world's existence today. And we can reject the first option that has always existed. It's made from material that's always existed. The characteristics of, of matter as studied by scientists show that that matter breaks down, that it degrades, it decays, it deteriorates. Characteristics that, quite frankly, are incompatible with being eternal. Not least, but one option. <coughs> the world was created by something, someone that always existed, an eternal, self-existent creator. I didn't say self-created creator again. That's an impossibility. For something to create itself out of nothing, I said a self-existent an eternal, self-existent creator. The very fact that we live in this world that we're a part of points to the existence of a self-existent creator. The existence of life points to the existence of a creator. How else, how else could life come from non-life? The life as we know it, living, breathing, self-conscious creatures coming from inanimate material like, like dust, stone. The complexity, the diversity, the interdependency of creation, again, points to a creator, a designer who put it all together. This universe could not come, or could not come about by accident, friends could not come about. To, to believe that is, is irrational, it, quite frankly, is, it is implausible to believe that this, this universe of which we are a part came about by accident. Let me give you one example. I, I, I take this from a, a little book by, by David Robertson, uh, a Free Church of Scotland, he used to be a Free Church of Scotland minister in, in Dundee, I think, and he's written this book for primarily for young people, Ask Real World Questions Real World Answers by, by David Robertson. An excellent little book, and I encourage you, if you have teenagers, I know that our, some of our CY leaders have it and are working their way through it. 
but I encourage you to buy it and, and work your way through it with your children. But the illustration that, that he gives, David Robertson gives, is, is, is again what we looked at back in Genesis. One of the, the, the examples whenever we, we study the book of Genesis, it's the example of our DNA. Now, the genetic code in, in every human cell contains 23 DNA molecules, each that contains somewhere between half a million and two and a half million nucleotide pairs. Each DNA, each strand of DNA in, in our cells is about five centimeters long. We have about three, tr three, ten trillion cells in our bodies. So if you took the DNA strands from each of those 10 trillion cells and, and you link them together end to end, they would go for something like 750 million miles. You have 750 million miles of DNA in your body, an adult body. The distance to the moon is something like 93 million miles. So your DNA could go to the moon, sorry, the sun is 93 million miles away. Your DNA could go to the sun and back about four times. The DNA in an adult body, your DNA could go to the sun and back four times. And all that DNA can consist of, of four simple building blocks, A, T, C, and G. All of us are made up of this simple information in a human genome, in a code that is fantastic, it is amazing, it is unique to each and every one of us. Robertson says, if you went down to the beach and you saw the words, I love you, written in seashells on the shore, would you assume that those seashells had been washed up by accident on the waves? Or would you think that someone had arranged them in that order? The answer is obvious, isn't it? Given that the human DNA code is a million times more complex than that simple message in the seashore, why should there not be an equally obvious answer as to why we have such a code, each and every one of us in our bodies? It's because we're made by an eternal, self-existent creator who designed us to be that way. The world, creation, life, the obvious design and interdependency of creation demands a creator. The world screams at us, you know, to look at the world, to study the world and conclude that it came out of nothing, that, that it just happened as, as an act of random chance. It is irrational. It is implausible. It did not happen. And the Bible states that, that reality in Romans 1, that passage that we read earlier, where Paul says that God's existence, his power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. The things that we see around us each and every day, they are evidence of a creator. The world we live in points to the existence of God. The second piece of evidence that points to the existence of God is our conscience. Our conscience. Across the, the wide divergence of cultures in the world, every last one of them shows an innate awareness of a supreme being. It's seen in, in the existence of religions in every last culture in the world. And where did that come from? That innate knowledge of a supreme being. And in all of us, in every human, there is an innate sense of right and wrong, of justice and, and injustice. We feel angry at being treated unfairly, being treated wrongly and unjustly, and it stirs within us a desire for justice. It's in us all. But if there's no such thing as God, there's no such thing as right or wrong. If we're simply a collection of, of atoms that is the product of, of random evolutionary processes, there's no supreme creator who made us, who tells us how he wants us to live, who, who gives us his standard of right and wrong, standards to which he says he's going to hold us accountable for. There's no such thing as that God, that creating God and his standards. Then we can live as we please. No one can tell us that something is right and something is wrong. 
we're perfectly entitled to do whatever we want. And no one can pull us up on that. That is the, the logical consequence of there being no God. If there's no God, then no one can tell President Putin tonight that, that it's wrong to kill innocent civilians in Ukraine. That, that it, it's wrong to bomb hospitals. That it's wrong to launch chemical warheads uh, against cities in Ukraine. Because if there's no God, there is no one with any right to say what's right or wrong. You and you alone are the only arbiter of what's right and wrong in your life. And yet within us all, within us all, there is an innate sense of right and wrong. We know those things that's happening in Ukraine are wrong. We all expect to be treated a certain way, and we, we know we deserve, we have a right to be treated a certain way. The very fact that we label things right and wrong, that we know innately right and wrong exists, that we try to do right, we try to avoid wrong, and we know that those who do wrong should be punished, it points to the existence of a God who has implanted his knowledge his standards of right or wrong in the very core of our being. And every time you put on the news and you hear a family of a murder victim call for justice, every time you, you hear the victim of a burglary condemn those who have stolen from him, every time you're stolen from or you're lied about or you're wronged, or you're treated unfairly, and in a sense of unfairness, you cry out for justice, it is an acknowledgement that there is a God who has implanted his sense of right and wrong in your conscience, in the very core of your being. The innate knowledge that we have, all of us, of what is right and what is wrong, our consciences prove that we are not the result of some evolutionary process of chance we are not the result of the survival of the fittest. We know, you know the survival of the fittest is wrong. Because otherwise, we would have no problem sitting back in our armchairs tonight and just waiting for the emergence of the fittest in Ukraine. For the biggest and the baddest to win, we would be content with that. The survival of the fittest was right. But we know that what's going on there is wrong, very wrong, and that proves there is a God who has implanted his sense of right or wrong, his standards of right or wrong, in each and every one of us. And there's no firm basis without God. There is no firm basis for saying anything is right or anything is wrong for demanding justice if there's no God. Our consciences, our innate knowledge of right and wrong, justice, our cry for justice, points to the existence of God. Creation and conscience, thirdly, Communication. The third piece of, of evidence that points to the existence of God is communication. And I'm thinking here of God's communication. God's communication. The same way that, that his girlfriend's voicemail messages or her letters to him points to, to this girl, his girlfriend's existence, so too God's communication to us points to his existence. How has God communicated with us? you might ask. Well, he's, he's revealed himself to people in the past. He has communicated directly. He has spoken, talked directly to people in the past, people like, like Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Samuel, other prophets. And what God spoke to them, they wrote down, they recorded for us in, the, in this book, the Bible. In the same way, 
that you can read today the words of Julius Caesar. You can read the words of, of George Washington or, or Lord Nelson. We can read today words that God spoke to men, which they wrote down. Words like, like, like those voicemail messages, like those letters, point to the existence of God. And the Bible not only records the direct words of God, but the testimony of those people whom God spoke to, people who saw God, people who heard him. You know, I've never met Julius Caesar, I never will. I've, I've never met George Washington or, or Lord Nelson, but I knew they existed. We all knew they existed because people who, who met those men wrote about meeting them wrote testimonies about meeting them, and we read those, and so we know they, that those people existed. And that's exactly what we have in the Bible. I witness testimony from people who God spoke to, who saw God, who God spoke to, and they wrote about those experiences. They wrote down what God said. Now, of course, if you don't believe there's a God, you won't believe that this, this book is God's word, God's communication to mankind, a record of his words. We're going to look at that next time, all being well, how we know the Bible is God's word. But very quickly, there's plenty of evidence pointing to the Bible being God's word. It's, its message, the wonder, the majesty of its message, its subject. There's no other book like it in the world. It's, it's consistency written over 1,500 years by something like 35 people writing 66 books, and it's perfectly consistent in every way. No contradictions. It's complexity, and yet it's simplicity, all point to it being God's Word, God's communication that proves He exists. Creation. Conscience, communication. Fourthly, the fourth piece, piece of evidence that points to the, the existence of God is Christ. Christ. In the dating program, I don't know if it's on television anymore, but the dating program, Take Me Out, Paddy McGuinness, the host, he, he stands there on his little platform as, as the host, uh, and he says, my wife's got her head in her hands at the back, if you could see her, he, he says to the, the single man who's, who's looking for a date, he says, single man, reveal yourself. Single man, reveal yourself. And that's the cry of the skeptic to God. You say, you know, if God exists, why doesn't he just reveal himself? God, reveal yourself is, is the cry of the skeptic. You say, I would believe if he revealed himself. But he has. He has revealed himself. He revealed himself, as we've seen, he's revealed himself in creation. He's revealed himself personally to people over the course of history. We have their eyewitness accounts in, in the Bible. But he's revealed himself in an even greater way. He has revealed himself by coming into this world as a man. The second person of the Godhead, God the Son, taking a human nature in union with his divine nature and coming into this world. And that man is Jesus. And that's what the Bible tells us about Jesus. He was God. He was God come into the world to reveal himself to mankind and to save mankind, to save sinful men and women from the punishment that we deserve for our sins, by going to the cross and taking our punishment upon himself. That's what the Bible reveals to us about this man, Jesus. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John, we have accounts of Jesus' life, and in those accounts, we read his claims to be God. John chapter 8, just a, a couple of examples. John chapter 8, John chapter 10, Jesus takes the name of God. I am the, the name that God revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, the I am who I am. Jesus takes the name of God and he applies it to himself. He says, I am. Clearly, unmistakably, he says, I am God. The Pharisees knew exactly what he was saying because they, they bent down, they picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. Jesus, this man, Jesus, claimed to be God. 
But claiming something doesn't make it true. I could claim to be God. I could claim to be an, an apple or an alpaca. It doesn't make it true. But Jesus doesn't only say that he's God. He shows that he is God. When the Gospels, read the Gospels. They record supernatural control over the wind, the way of storms as he, as he calmed the storms on the, on the Sea of Galilee. How he walked on water. He fed 5,000 people with nothing but two lo five loaves and two fish. He cured sickness. He, he cured paralysis, blindness, deafness. He cast out demons. He raised people from the dead. He did things that no ordinary man, no mere man could do. Things that only God could do. He did. Proving that he's God. Now to that many people say nonsense. Nonsense. Gospel. It's the Bible. It's, it's nothing but a fairy story. And again, we'll look at that next time. But very quickly, these gospel accounts, they are histories, they are biographies of Jesus' life that are written by eyewitnesses, people who saw him, who spoke to him, who heard him, who sat under his ministry, who watched him, listened to him on a daily basis. In 1 John 1 verse 1, the apostle John writes, speaking about Jesus, he says, that which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which we have touched with our hands. John says, we saw him. We heard him. We listened to him. We looked upon him. We, we touched him with our hands. He was real. These are eyewitness accounts of this man, Jesus, the life of Jesus. They are as reliable. They are as worthy of being believed as any eyewitness testimony in any court throughout our country today. And these eyewitness accounts record how Jesus clearly and unmistakably claimed to be God. He said he was God and he showed he was God. You know, and if they were made up, you know, they're just fabricated stories, you know, wouldn't they have been laughed out of town whenever they were, they were first written and, and, and first produced and published? If someone makes an outlandish claim today, what did President Putin's foreign minister say today? We didn't attack Ukraine. Nonsense. And he was laughed out of town. It's immediately dismissed. It, it, it's, it's ignored as, as a fallacy, as a fabrication. You know, if these gospel accounts were, were a fabrication, why weren't they immediately dismissed as, as fantasy? as make-believe, as fairy stories, as claimed today. Because they were written shortly after Jesus' death when there were so many eyewitness, so many eyewitnesses to the events that they recorded that they couldn't be dismissed as fairy story, as fabrication. The people knew that what were recorded here in the Gospels actually took place. Friends, God's revelation of himself in the person of Jesus, this man who said he was God, who showed unmistakably, without a shadow of a doubt, that he was God. They point to the existence of God. There's no other rational or reasonable explanation. Creation, your conscience, God's communication, Christ. Fifthly, and, and finally, this the final piece of, of evidence we're going to consider that points to the, the existence of God is conversion. Conversion. That dramatic change in the 15-year-old boy. You parents who, who live with, with teenagers, you know, the, you know adolescent teenagers, the, the solemn demeanor. All of a sudden, the 15-year-old boy in his face is, is lit up with, with joy, uh, happiness. The skip in his step, the smile on his face, where formerly was that, that sullen look of, of a young adolescent boy. It is evidence that his claim to, to, to have a girlfriend is real, it's genuine, it's true. 
and so too that the dramatic change that we see in the lives of Christians, men and women who claim to have met God, they claim to have met God, come to believe in God, and trust in God for the forgiveness that he offers through Christ. The dramatic change, the complete U-turn, the turnabout in their lives is evidence for the existence of God. We just think about the, the, the turnaround, the change in the disciples. Men who were simple, they were fearful, they were timid, they were inarticulate, they were selfish. Self-obsessed men, and they were transformed, completely transformed into bold, selfless witnesses. Men who were prepared to die. Men to a man, I think, all but one who did die because they refused to deny Jesus claimed to be God. Completely transformed. The Apostle Paul, a convinced skeptic, he didn't believe one word that came out of Jesus' mouth, and he set out to crush, to kill those who believed and, and spread the lies that Jesus has said, as he thought. But when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was completely transformed to the most committed follower. And instead of putting his followers to death, he died. He went to death gladly, proudly in Jesus' name. What can account for such a dramatic conversion and turnaround but the transforming power of God doing in people's lives, transforming them as he promises in his word? And it's a transformation we see not only in the Bible, not only in these, these, the lives of these people recorded for us in Scripture, it's a transformation we see recorded throughout history. You know, skeptics turned into believers, fearful men and women becoming fearless, ardent agnostics and, and atheists transformed into the most ardent of adherents, selfish, self-serving, self-seeking, sadistic men and women transformed. A transformation pointing to the transforming power of God. Read a biography of Isaac Newton, a slave ship captain, an evil, wicked, brutal, murderous tyrant. And read about what happened when he came into contact with God. God spoke into his life, the transformation in his life. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was something, but now I'm free. Completely transformed, turned around when confronted by God and Christ, evidence of the transforming power of God. And all of those conversions, the transformation in these people's lives, it's not the result of, of psychosis or psychological episode or attempts to get their lives back on track. It's not people turning over a new leaf. It's a transformation for which there's, there's only one reasonable, rational explanation. And it's a transforming power of God, men and women having come into contact with God and having been transformed by him through that interaction with him. And these conversions, every one of these conversions from the most radical conversion to the most simple, it points to the existence of God. And friends, to say that you would believe in God, you know, if, if, if only God would reveal himself, I would believe him, I believe in him. You know, there's not enough evidence. If there was more evidence, I would believe in God's existence. Friends, the problem is not that there's not enough evidence. There's plenty of evidence. The problem is very simply that you don't want to accept the evidence 
and you don't want to accept it because of its implications. You don't want to accept that, that God exists, that he created you, that he has the authority to tell you how you're to live, that you'll be held to account and you'll be punished by him. You don't want to accept that. So rather than accept that, you respond by burying your head in the sand and convincing yourself. Try to convince yourself there's not enough evidence. There's not enough evidence. As Paul says in Romans 1 verse 25, you have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. You prefer to believe a lie. And quite frankly, a lie that requires more faith to believe than the faith it takes to believe in God. And for that, the Bible calls you a fool. Psalm 14. In Psalm 53, the writer of those Psalms says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. If you say there's no God, you're going against what rational logic points to being true. You're going against what the weight of evidence points to being true. You're going against what you know in your heart as being true. The Bible says you're a fool. And you're a fool because of the consequences. By refusing to accept what you know in your heart to be true, what rational logic proves to be true, you're condemning yourself to the punishment of God rather than receiving the forgiveness he freely offers by simply accepting him, by accepting his forgiveness, by accepting his existence and the forgiveness he offers in Christ. And one day, you know, if you're rejecting God, you're burying your head in, in the sand and you're rejecting him, you're denying his existence, one day you will stand before God and you'll not be able to deny his existence. He has revealed himself to you in the person of Jesus so that you can stand before him in joy rather than fear. And you're a fool. You're a fool if you refuse to accept the evidence and continue to reject him. There's one more way that that 15-year-old boy can convince his friends of the reality of his girlfriend. He can pick up his phone. He can ring her. And he can hand it to his friends and say, speak to her. Talk to her. And friends, that's as, as true of us tonight. If you're searching for God today, genuinely, genuinely searching for God, you don't know if there's a God, but you're, you're searching for the answers, you can do that very thing. You can speak to him. You can speak to him, talk to him in prayer, ask him to reveal himself to you, to convince you of his existence. And friends, that is a prayer. Ask genuinely and sincerely that God delights to hear an answer. So if that's you tonight, talk to him. Ask him to reveal himself to you, that you might know in your heart that he is real and you're right with him. Amen. Amen.